Warning, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to Baby Talk 101. My name is Tim Tremone and I'm the Associate Executive Director of Alumni Engagement and Outreach at the University of Maryland Alumni Association. Thank you for participating today and thank you for being a member of the Alumni Association. We are pleased to be able to partner with the College of Behavior and Social Sciences on this webinar. Our presenter, Nan Bernstein Ratner, is a professor um, of the Department of Hearing and Speech Sciences here at the University of Maryland College Park. She is a fellow and honors recipient of the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. Her primary areas of research are fluency development and disorder, stuttering, psycholinguistics, and the role of adult input and interaction in child language development. The author of numerous research articles, chapters, and edited texts, she is also a board-recognized specialized specialist in child language disorders. In 2006, Professor Bernstein Ratner received the Distinguished Researcher Award from the International Fluency Association. In 2014, she was made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. With that introduction, please welcome uh, Professor Ratner. Hi. Hi, thank you very much. It's great to be able to talk to so many of you, even if I can't see see you guys. Um, I uh, would like to spend a little bit of time today talking about how children learn to talk and talking about how adults play a very, very important role in all of this. Um, Baby talk is an odd thing to do research in, in some respects. It's not very hard to go to the web and find all sorts of uh, vid visuals or columns that kind of imply that if you speak, quote, baby talk to your child, you're both nonsensical and doing your child some harm. Um, in fact, we know that it's just the opposite, um, and that's what I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you. But I will tell you that um, uh, when we do present our research in various venues around the world um, and newspapers pick it up, they sometimes tease. So I thought I would uh, give you a little taste of how this research sometimes gets covered uh, with kinds of discussions like linguists goes gaga over the value of baby talk. Um, but what I'm going to explain to you is that no matter how silly baby talk sounds to an outsider, it's doing some wonderful things for your kid, and so you should be proud to speak baby talk to your kid. I'm going to give you just a couple of small bullet facts about what we know about baby talk. And this work doesn't just come from our laboratories, although I've been doing this work for many, many years. It comes from labs all over the world and in other languages. Um, first of all, what is baby talk? We actually, when we write about it, we don't use the term baby talk because it's ambiguous. Um, are we talking about the baby talking or are we talking about the parents talking to the baby? So we usually call it infant or child directed speech, but some people have called it motherese. And I may use that term from time to time, but I want to make it clear that everybody who speaks to babies more or less talks to them differently than they speak to children of an older age or to uh, adults of their own age. Um, and it's found all around the world uh, and has similar features in virtually every society that's been examined. If I have time at the end of this talk uh, before uh, uh, it's over and if we don't have a lot of questions, I may talk about the very few societies that we found around the world that don't have a baby talk register like we do uh, because very interesting things happen to the kids in those societies. It turns out that they learn language more slowly. Now, all around the world, regardless of what language people are speaking, it turns out that Speech to babies and, and young toddlers has very similar features. Generally, we raise our pitch when we speak to little kids and infants. We tend to use a very sing-song, exaggerated prosody um, where we have um, huge sweeps of going from low to high and back down again, almost a musical cadence to talking to children. We tend to use very short utterances when we talk to little kids as opposed to speaking to adults, and we tend to repeat them a lot. And I'll give you some examples of the kinds of interactions that we see. And we also use different vocabulary. We tend not to use very, very uh, sophisticated vocabulary for little kids. We often, in fact, have a special set of words that we'll use when talking to small uh, infants and children. So we, in English, for instance, don't talk about our stomach as much as we talk about our tummy. 
And so there are actually some baby talk words that don't look like words you would share amongst other people in, in the society. Um, we also tend to use words more repetitively, and I'll, I'll talk about that and what it does for the child. And as I said, exceptions to having a baby talk register are quite rare in societies around the world, and when we see them Children don't do as well learning language as, as early. Obviously, they all wind up being speaking adults, but it tends to take them longer to figure out how to use the language like an older child or an adult does. So you'll hear people tell you that you shouldn't talk baby talk to a baby, um, that it somehow demeans the child or gives the child a very strange representation of what the language is about. But we know some things about baby talk that have been tested out in laboratories um, and seem to suggest that infants come sort of pre-wired to want to listen to the kinds of things that adults do with them this way. So in a laboratory situation, uh, and when infants can suck on a nipple, for instance, to hear something coming through speakers, they will suck longer and harder and prefer to hear adults talking to them in a baby talk register compared to adults speaking to them in the kind of way in which adults would speak to other adults. When we look at what they can learn, and we can actually measure what infants learn, although it's a little bit complicated to explain how these kinds of experiments are conducted in the space of the time we have here, but if we try and get children to remember things that are said to them and recognize them a little bit later, it turns out that infants will do much better um, if they are exposed to things to remember that are uh, delivered in baby talk register rather than in a normal uh, tone of voice or the way we would speak to an adult. Um, and in fact, in many cases, they don't show any learning if you would speak to them in the kind of uh, language format that we would use talking from one adult to the other. So. One of the things we know is that baby talk is a more learnable system. That's the point of the first thing that I want to say here. Um, the second thing that we know about baby talk is that it's so very um, clear and well structured as a language input that we've had experiments conducted around the world to see if a computer can learn to decode human speech, figure out the rules of a language from the input. And baby talk register is so clear and well constructed that computers can figure out the rules of a language when given a transcript of baby talk as opposed to being given a transcript of adult-adult communication. So there seems to be some very learnable uh, qualities that it has. Um, and I've been pretty impressed with that over the years because uh, my own database that I uh, collected many, many years ago when I first started doing this work was actually one of the first to be learned by a computer and it made me quite proud <laughs> that the computer could learn from the motherese that I had collected. The last point I'll make here is that we know something very, very important and it's starting to have really big policy implications. And that is that the more infants are talked to and with, the better their language skills are. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that in some groups of our own society, um, some infants are not hearing very much language through the, through the day. Um, and as a result, um, we can link directly the amount of input that they're hearing, the amount of interaction that they're getting with parents or other adults, and delays that they experience when they go to school. So, just a cartoon to set us up for the rest of the talk, but most babies do prefer baby talk. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the very beginning of language learning and, and try and uh, talk about a couple of things before I move straight on to talking about how adults talk to children and say a few words about what babies are listening to and what babies are learning first. So there are some notions out there, um, and sometimes people think they're myths, that you could teach your baby certain things about language or music or sound before a baby is born. And the question is, is that true? 
It actually is. Um, there are some things that babies clearly learn before they're born. Babies can hear in the last trimester of pregnancy, not before, but in the last trimester of pregnancy, babies can hear things. Now, they don't hear an awful lot of detail in the signal, and if you want to imagine what they're hearing, it's probably a lot like being at the bottom of a swimming pool and trying to figure out what people are saying around the edges, of, you know, up on top, uh, around the edges of the pool. Um, but what babies can get is they can get the rhythm and cadence of music or speech. And so I'm showing you a slide right now that is actually uh, pictures from an actual study that was done many, many years ago uh, in 1980 where they asked mothers in their last trimester of pregnancy to read the same book every night out loud, essentially to their stomachs. Um, and they actually divided the groups in two such that half the mothers read one book and half the mothers read another. After the babies were born, what you see here is a picture of a baby hooked to a nipple that is going to measure how rapidly and strongly the baby is sucking, and babies suck a lot when they're interested. Babies would suck longer and harder to listen to the book that their mother had read in the last trimester of pregnancy and not the book their mother had not read in the last trimester of pregnancy. So we know that babies are starting to get sensitized to uh, what they're listening to um, in the sense that some people have urged that you might sensitize your child to music if you play music to your stomach in the last trimester of pregnancy. It's not clear that you create a musical prodigy that way, but maybe you'd get a baby sort of appreciated uh, what various types of music sound like in terms of beat and cadence. Now, in the labs here at the University of Maryland, we do an awful lot of work with very young infants, starting from just a couple of months of age and going all the way up until age four, which is uh, when we we start to use different types of techniques, um, what we are able to do is bring babies into a laboratory situation and we can watch their eyes as they listen to certain sounds played through speakers in the dark. And you're seeing a, a father here holding his son and we've uh, actually put uh, headphones on the father so he can't really hear anything and he can't tip off his child to what he's listening to. And we can tell that by the first, uh, the, the latter half of the first year of life, by about seven months of age, for instance, babies will directly look at speakers where they hear their own name, uh, as opposed to names that we develop in the lab that sound very much like their own name. Uh, so um, uh, I will not give you a regular child's name, but I will tell you that um, we know that your pets at home can do a little bit of this too. Uh, but for instance, my old dog, Oreo, used to turn when I called him Romeo meaning that he couldn't tell the difference between those two very similar names, and no human baby would ever make that mistake. Um, they know the difference between things that sound that similar, like Oreo and Romeo, uh, by seven months of age. By eight months of age, we can uh, essentially teach them words, and uh, we can just play over and over again something like bike, 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 over and over again for about a minute or two, and then we can read stories to them that either have that word in them uh, or don't have that word in them, and the babies will preferentially look only to the speaker that has the story with the word bike in it, and that's by eight months of age. So by eight months of age, babies are recognizing individual words that are spoken in conversations. As time goes by and you get a year of age, 18 months of age, and you're saying single words, uh, so you're only saying things like mama, for instance, or cookie, um, they can understand much longer sentences. So on the slide you're seeing now, a baby is looking at two screens where we have some famous cartoon characters or TV show characters. Uh, we have Cookie Monster and Big Bird, and they can see a screen where Cookie Monster is pushing Big Bird, and they can see a screen where, Co where Big Bird is pushing Cookie Monster, and they will look only at the screen that matches the sentence we're saying. So if we're saying Cookie Monster pushes Big Bird, they look at both screens, but then they only look at the screen that matches that particular sentence. Meaning that by only a year of age, children are starting to understand in English that word order tells you who's the subject and who's the object of a sentence. So 
grandparents have said for a long time that little pitchers have big ears, and we know that that's true. Little babies have enormous capacity to understand language. They've already started out understanding things before they were born, in a sense, and now they're really interpreting a lot of the world through the language that they hear. We do this, by the way, in the labs here at Maryland, and I thought I'd put in just a fast blurb for where uh, this all happens, um, and we have a lot of alumni who come in with their babies and uh, enjoy our experiments and see how much their children know. So if you enjoy these kinds of discussions, please join us at some point at that website and see what you can do to help us. Um, one of the things that we learn from all of these studies, and this is where I come from in my background because by training before I came into research I was a speech language pathologist, is that while kids are amazing, not every child learns as rapidly or as well as others. And so that's, in a sense, what has um, driven our most recent set of studies here at Maryland. We've been tracking lots of families over 125 families and their children and we started just after six months of age and we've been tracking them uh, to age two and are still tracking them beyond that point thanks to research sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Um, this work that uh, I'm doing with uh, the current chair of the department, Rochelle Newman, um, shows that some of the early work I just talked about in terms of child ability, um, we can predict as early as seven or eight months of age how well a child will use language as far out as entry to kindergarten. Um, and we're using these types of um, findings to justify studying populations where we know that many more children than usual might have delays, such as siblings who already have another family member with autism. And that's the work that we're doing right now to look at what infants know uh, early in the language development process. And I've given you a link for where you can uh, see what we're doing uh, on that topic. But I'm going to return to what children are uh, making of the input that they hear in this process. So um, literally, um, while we were doing all of the investigations of the infants in these studies, we did remind the funders that the infants could not bring themselves to the lab and that while they were here, we should be um, looking at what their parents uh, do when they talk to them. And so in addition to those infant studies I just talked about, we put uh, the parents and the children in a toy room, basically, and recorded how they interacted over a set of toys. And we were looking to see how parents differ in how they talk to the young children and whether or not that made a difference as the children got older. So what we do, as I said, is we bring them in multiple times. We brought them in about five times over the course of this study, and uh, we let them play as they would at home. Of course, we realize that they're not at home, but we ask them to pretend that they're just doing things they would do at home. And then we spend a lot of time and energy transcribing what they say and use fairly sophisticated computer programs to analyze the nature and the quantity of the speech that the adults use with the children. And in the study that I'm going to talk about briefly today, um, it turns out that at the end of this project, we've wound up <clears throat> excuse me, with one of the largest samples of mother ease ever compiled. Um, it has uh, recordings from over 1,250 sessions, almost a half a million child address words, and a quarter of a million utterances that the children heard while they were in, in our laboratories. We make transcripts that look like this. Um, I'm only pointing them out to you because there's a nifty um, uh, advantage to these programs. Um, we have what the parents are saying and what the children's are, children are saying. Um, and then, thankfully, at this point in our development, we have computers tell us what the grammar is supposed to be. Um, we've discovered that if we give it to our lab assistants to use as homework, we don't always get answers that are as good <laughs> as letting the computer decide what the grammar is. Um, but a lot of us would wish we'd had this in high school English class, I think. Um, so that's a transcript, and then we put the transcript through a number of sets of analyses. And what we're finding, I'll go through in a couple of uh, little bullets for you and explain how you can use this information to help your child at home. First of all, we were gratified to find out that we duplicated other research done on smaller samples. And that is that the more parents 
talk to their children during these sessions, the more they actually sp spend time talking to their child instead of just playing with the toys but not saying anything, the better off their children were at the end of the two years. They had better scores on language tests and they themselves used more advanced language as toddlers. One of the other things we found is that the amount of vocabulary measured in two different ways was a really big predictor of where children wound up. So parents, mothers in this case, who used more different words when they were describing the toys in the sessions, they literally had more um, uh, unique words that they used in the course of the interaction, had, better, had children with better outcomes. But most importantly, and this was very new in the literature, was that we found that mothers who repeated words more often, so that they used a lot of words, but they also didn't say a word just once. If they were naming a toy, they named it repeatedly repeatedly, they used names for the uh, objects repeatedly, that it was that repetition that also gave an added bump to the kids when they got to be two years of age. And I think that makes good sense to any of us who've ever been in a learning situation that hearing something once is not necessarily a good way to have it stick. Um, but this was something that hadn't been documented in the literature before. Now, other parent behaviors that we found in this enormous data set followed over time um, was in fact, confirmative of information that had been hypothesized to be true about 30 years ago. People were saying that certain things would help children, but really had not been documented. And it was the benefit of these big computer programs that we had that allowed us to look at the data in this way. So we were actually able to find out that although a lot of people think that kids learn to talk by imitating grown-ups, basically, it's not quite that way at all. Children did best when their parents attempted to imitate what the child said and then do something with that. So we have a way, literally, of turning the tables on this process and asking who's imitating whom. And it turns out that parents who actually listen to what their child said and echo it and then expand it in various ways tend to have children who are much more talented in terms of language profiles at the end of two years than children whose parents do this less frequently. And I'm going to give you an example on the next slide of what um, an expansion or a recast might look like so that you can appreciate that. The other thing that we just found, and this is literally a result that's only a couple of weeks old, is that the speed of speech was important for children as well. So parents who spoke to their children more slowly but naturally, so we're not talking about parents speaking as though they are a record played at the wrong speed, but parents who were somewhat slower than other parents in talking to their children had children who had higher rates of language development at the end of two years. So all of these factors tended to boost language performance. Let me go back and talk a little bit about the expansion or what we call recasting model because this is something that we understand quite well in speech and language development research, but a lot of parents wouldn't necessarily know what it looks like. It tends to look like this. The child says something, often when they're very little, um, before a year of age, they'll say simply a noun, something like block or blocks. And then the kind of interaction that was associated with very good language outcomes looks a little bit like this, uh, and I'm going to read it out to you, um, which can strike you as being a little bit of overkill, but it's in fact this kind of overkill that tends to make a good language learner. So the child says one thing, blocks. The mother says, blocks. Yes, they have blocks in here. Do you want to play with the blocks? We can pile them up. We can build with the blocks. And then the child usually does chip in at some point, particularly closer to two years, and says, hmm, build blocks. And the mother goes on, yes, let's build with them. Let's build with the blocks. Do you like building with the blocks? And so on and so forth. I used to say early in my career that you could go legally stupid transcribing this stuff, but that's because we're the adults. When you're the child, this is the kind of interaction that really, really helps. Whoops. And I just skipped. There we go. Now, I want to um, say a couple of words about fatheries because I've actually, um, there aren't too many people that look at father speech to kids, but we've done it here at the University of Maryland, and I find it very, very interesting. It does turn out that um, fathers speak somewhat like mothers when they speak to their young children, but in some ways they're very, very different. 
moms tend to make things a lot easier for kids than dads do. And I'll give you an example of this. We actually did an experiment where we gave sort of odd toys to one and two year old children and watched their parents play with them individually. So what you're seeing here is a Fisher Price compass and you're seeing a Barbie doll. Um, and what we found is that mothers often referred to the compass as a watch, whereas the fathers said it was a compass, which it is. And we did have mothers who actually called that nice little lady in the hot pants the baby when trying to play with it in a toy session, whereas no father ever tried to call that thing a baby. Uh, a babe maybe, but not a baby. Um, and it turns out that this is something that people have looked at in the literature Fathers tend to believe, when we interview them, that children won't learn to talk if you don't essentially use words the way they're meant to be used. Mothers sometimes say just the opposite. If you say to them, why did you call the compass a watch, they'll say, well, I think he's too young to understand what a compass is, but it looks a lot like a watch that he has. So I'm going to call it a watch so I can meet, meet him halfway. In this, at least in Western society, we believe that dads tend to create a bridge to adult language, which is kind of helpful also. And be because of this, we are sometimes worried when we watch language development get slowed down in children from socioeconomically disadvantaged households. Because in addition to some of the things I'll talk about in a moment, in addition to just hearing less, very often there's a higher level of, of uh, fatherlessness in those families. And we know that men tend to present a little bit more challenge to kids. Between two parents, most kids tend to do just fine in figuring things out. But fathers tend to be good at boosting vocabulary in young children, we think. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes now talking about some hot topics. Whenever I give a talk like this, these are the things people ask me about. So one of the things people ask me about, including in this department when we have babies born, is what would make a good baby gift or what can I do to give my kid a real you know, sort of leg up uh, before they enter school. And one of the most famous uh, kinds of uh, teaching tools is so-called Baby Einstein videos, but there are lots of similar videos out there. And they're meant to sort of present information to your child, amuse them and teach them at the same time, and teach them basic concepts that they will need when they enter school. Um, there were a lot of comments and assertions made about uh, the benefits of these teaching videos for children and lately um, I have to inform you that most companies are being forced legally to step back from them and I will explain why. The reality is that in some studies that have been run, most notably a few years back with the Baby Einstein series, it actually turned out that babies who were exposed to Baby Einstein scored more poorly on most measures of language and school readiness than children who did not get exposed to baby Einstein. Now I want to be very, very clear about why we think this is. We don't think that baby Einstein basically kills a kid's language system or does something negative to their brains. What we do think is happening is that when parents use it as a substitute for interaction with their children, they are giving their child access to one system that is actually a poorer learning system than simply sitting there and chatting with your kid over the blocks. That it's much better to interact with your child over toys or over what you're looking at or where you're going than to put your child in front of a video. So this is an example of where a baby teaching device is actually just the inverse. You are the better teacher than these supposed expert, expert tapes that you can play for your child. The other reason why these things don't tend to work is that it needs to be the interaction between babies and other people in their environment that helps them learn language. Um, they have to understand what other people are interested in, need to know that you know what they're interested in, and try and link up what they're doing and what they're seeing and what other people are doing and seeing with the words. And so that's why you'll get better results uh, than a Baby Einstein video by simply sitting and reading or playing with your baby using the same kinds of toys you had when you were growing up. Or a box, a paper box from the toys, as many of you know, is more fascinating than the toy that's inside of it, or sand or dirt or bath toys or anything. All sorts of natural interaction environments are much better for children than prepackaged uh, kinds of teaching videos. 
And in fact, the interaction is so important that in the societies that I mentioned earlier, where adults really don't use baby talk in talking to their children, the most well-studied one is actually the Quiche Mayan in Central America, who really believe that children should not be talked to until they can talk themselves. And most of the child care in that um, culture is provided by older siblings. Um, what we actually know from, from recent research that's been done that's very compelling is that children in that environment do hear adults talk all the time, but they're talking to one another. And that so-called overheard speech, the speech that they hear that is being shared between adults but not addressed to them, does them absolutely no good in learning language. It is only the amount of speech that children hear while they're interacting with people that make good language development happen. And that's one reason and why, of course, children would not learn language from simply watching TV. That's not interactive either. Another thing that parents often ask about is what do I think of these baby teaching devices that purport to help you teach your child to read at a very young age? Age. And uh, there are lots of vendors out there, and some with very compelling testimonials that say that they have taught you know children less than a year old to read. Well, that sort of depends on what you call reading. Um, I point out to people who ask a question like this that we know that lots of animals can learn to read flashcards. You can teach your dog, and I can tell you how to teach your dog if you want to learn to do that. Uh, children have used that as a science fair project in a number of communities. You can teach do dogs to recognize symbols on flashcards. You can teach sea lions to read. You can teach parrots to read. But what they're doing is they're matching a word to a concept. And that is not the kind of reading that we consider most meaningful in society. Simply knowing that the stop sign says stop really doesn't do us much better good than knowing that the shape of that sign tells us to stop. Um, what we mean by reading is being able to figure out, for instance, that in a language like English, words like Jack and Jill have sounds like J and A and K. And as work done here and in other places clearly shows, that actually requires a mentality that most children don't have until preschool, usually not the age of four. You can sometimes push that down a little bit. But knowing that letters correspond to sounds and that words are comprised of sounds is something that little kids find very difficult to do until they are about four. The other thing is that reading is not reading words. W reading is reading sentences and understanding what they mean. And so most of us wouldn't do very well trying to, if somebody said, can you read French? And I don't know who's listening at the other end to tell me that. But you know, if you haven't spoken any French, your ability to read French and understand what it's saying to you is going to be very, very limited. So when children go to school, they're going to have to learn not just to decode symbols and learn words one-on-one, -on -one, they're going to have to learn to decode whole sentences and understand what those sentences mean. That's the sort of stuff that is actually enabled by language. And we know that literacy, children's ability to do well in reading and literacy tasks is directly related to how good their language is. Um, so the more language your child has, the better off they're going to do learning to read. They are not necessarily helped by learning how to read flashcards as babies. Some people ask if it's good to teach your child a sign language, like baby signs, or teach them another language, like Spanish. Well, there are a couple of things to say about this. Um, there is some evidence that baby signs can be fun for, for adults and children to use. It doesn't seem to give them a real leg up on oral language, but it does enable some children who are not as good orally to try and communicate using their hands as well because the hands mature a few months before your mouth does basically in development. Certainly it doesn't seem to hurt language, oral language development, but it doesn't really advantage your child permanently. And unless you were going to keep up that system, which is really not uh, a native sign language, you're going to lose that advantage over time. So baby signs might be fun. and. Um, I'm all for it if you're going to interact more with your child at the same time and talk while you're doing it. But other than that, it's not going to give you something that's long-lasting. Um, if it 
it fascinates you, try it, but it's not necessarily going to give you uh, lifelong benefits or even short-term benefits. Now, teaching your child Spanish or some other language, there are a couple of ways to do this, and there are a couple of ways not to do this. Um, the best way to teach your child another language is to have a human being around who speaks that language. So if you have um, a child care provider who speaks in another language natively, current advisement is to have that caretaker speak to your child using that language um, and not, for instance, use the, a language they know less well if they don't know English very well, for instance. It's better to have them speak to your child in their native language and that's the way that you get a native language user. But please remember that when you teach a young child another language that is not going to be heard around the house afterwards, uh, so if Spanish is taught for a while and then not brought up again and it's not spoken in the home, you will, you, you will lose it. So language is very much use it or lose it and there is no uh, apparent benefit to a child being taught another language early on in life and then uh, it drops because there's nobody around who's interested anymore. When you go back into school and if you pick up Spanish then in uh, middle school or high school, you show no advantage from having had that language earlier um, as an educational experience. A lot of people are pretty concerned, um, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, about the use of TV and computers in front of kids. Um, and I think that there is there's reason for this, and I'm very sympathetic to it, but I'm going to tell you something that you might find surprising, which is that I'm not completely convinced that TVs and computers are something to be avoided. It's how they're used rather than whether they're used. We know from early studies of TV watching that it was basically good for children to watch television with their parents as long as the parents were watching it with them and talking with them about what was going on. And in fact, early studies talked about using television as sort of a moving book, that it was, a, it, it was telling stories through video uh, the way you would sit and go through a book with a child. So we're pretty much convinced, in my field at least, that it's not the technology that's important here, it's what you do with it. So if you're going to put a tablet in front of a baby in a high chair um, or a rocker the way the top picture shows and then walk out and do something else, that is absolutely not a good idea. It is, given the baby Einstein experience, uh, probably going to lead to less rapid language growth or conceptual growth than if you did something else. But it's okay to sit and read a book on a tablet with your child and point to the pictures and simply page, you know, go through the pages with a hand swipe. It, that is not changing the value of the interaction that you're having with your child. So it's really about the interaction and it's not about the mechanism. The last section I'm going to talk about before opening uh, the uh, floor for questions is to talk about um, some recent inventions in our field that have gone from being somewhat suspect kinds of concepts to being very, very important in research. A few years back, a company called Lena developed a device. It was a little recorder that you could stick into your child's bib overalls and you could record all the language that your child heard during the day. At the end of the day, you uploaded the audio to a computer somewhere else and it told you using mathematical extrapolations basically how many words the child had heard addressed to him or her during the day. And it could also distinguish between live voices and radio and television, which was very, very interesting to a lot of parents. Some of us were a little bit suspicious of this device when it was first marketed because to some of us it seemed like a very, very sophisticated nanny cam meant to figure out whether or not your babysitter was putting your child in front of the television or leaving them to their own devices while they chatted on their cell phones. After some feedback, the company changed its marketing strategy and it is now a research tool and as a research tool it's doing incredible things and I'm going to show you that. One of the things we've known for a number of years, as I said earlier, is that the number of words a child hears predicts how well a child does in early language and early school performance. One of the things that was discovered in the early 1980s by the team of Hart and Risley um, was that the number of words that children hear is sometimes determined in, a, in uh, in many respects by the social class that the children are growing up in.
And this is for a number of reasons. It can be because of the quality of daycare, but it can also be because parents' understanding of what helps child language development may differ as a function of education. What Hart and Risley found is that children in upper middle class families in the United States heard more than twice as many words as children from lower working, working class environments and even those children heard almost uh, twice as many words as children did if they came from extremely low income families. What was then quite clear on school entry and using research looking at the children from preschool entry onward is that there was an almost identical relationship between how many words children tended to hear in a day and what their vocabulary was like as they went from a year to three and be, three years of age and beyond. And now what we're doing is together with the Lena Foundation and with federal funding sources, um, a number of projects are online around the United States. I'll call your attention to two that are very interesting to attempt to cure what has been called the poverty of words by having parents from different language communities um, put Lena's on their children and meet with professionals to review how many words their child hears per day, measure it against the kinds of, um, of interactions that we think are more fostering of children, and teaching parents that what they say to their child and what their child hears is important in learning language. Give them the self-efficacy to understand that the more that they the more language they expose their child to, the better off their child will be when they enter school. The two major projects um, on record, and you can find them online very easily, are a project in Providence called Providence Speaks, Providence, Rhode Island, and a program in Chicago called the 30 Million Words Project. One of the things we're very much interested in exploring here at Maryland is um, extending programs like this to our local Title I schools in the community uh, because many of them are concerned by that word gap. Um, we've just had conversations this very week with the mayor of Hyattsville about this problem. Well, um, I'm going to say that there is an awful lot of good stuff out there for parents to look at if they want a more conversational approach to how to help your child prepare for language and prepare for school. I'm very fond of these three. Um, Einstein never used flashcards written by a couple of friends of mine who uh, point out that play is good for you and that you learn language from interacting with your environment. Um, a book on how children learn to talk by the same team, and a very interesting book called The Scientist in the Crib, which talks about how much babies know well before we have any sense that they are so smart. They're very, very enjoyable books, and if you want to buy one for somebody you know expecting a child, I think they'll get a lot out of it. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to leave some time for people to ask some questions about baby talk or about how their children learn language, and I'll, I'll try and answer them. Nan, I'm going to start off with a question from. I have to now switch off. Okay. It's a question from Myra. She said there have been differences of opinion among medical community and research regarding tongue tie and speech development. Can you speak to whether a tongue tie self corrects with speech development or can have negative effects? So tongue tie actually does exist. Um, but it's actually much rarer than you think. It's called ankyloglossia. And um, here's the thing to think about. Um, if a tongue is really rooted so firmly to the front of the mouth that you should be having problems eating as well as speaking, um, no speech sounds are made using the tongue sticking out any further than out through your teeth a little in a sound like th, you know, th. Um, if your child can do that, the chances that they can't make the speech sounds of English are pretty, pretty rare. Um, so there are very few cases where we as speech people find that um, doing something to cure tongue tie surgically is very necessary. Um, but if the child is having feeding problems or swallowing problems, um, then yes, by all means, it's something that can be looked at. We have a request to go back to the list of the books um, that you had up. Oh, sure. I can do that and while, right there. And while you're doing that, um, it's a, I have a question from Sean that says, my baby is a seven-month-old preemie, or seven-month preemie, sorry, born at 31 weeks. 
how would this mm -hmm. typically change their speech development? Yeah, so we actually do think that um, preemies need a little bit of extra time to catch up, and we usually um, peg them behind by the degree of prematurity, usually no more than that. So uh, a baby who's two months premature would be expected to show the communication development of a child uh, two months younger. Um, but, uh, of course, prematurity can have other consequences, and so uh, low birth weight, um, possible oxygen deprivation, other medical complications, uh, these things can make a difference. One of the things uh, one of our colleagues is working on up in Boston that we're very fascinated by is the degree to which being premature and being in the NICU for long periods of time can adversely impact language development because when you're in the NICU, people are not able to talk to you as much and they, uh, there's a lot of machine noise in the background that makes learning a little bit more difficult. Difficult. And in fact, there's a very fascinating set of research coming out uh, up at the Beth Israel in Boston that attempts to put recordings of maternal speech. Uh, mothers are asked to record speech to their children, and that that uh, those sounds are piped into the bassinets in the NICUs to try and help the preemies get the natural head start on language that they would have if their parents were able to hold them 20 hours a day and talk to them. And the uh, research tends to indicate that those babies are making much better progress both medically as well as developmentally than children in a typical NICU setting. I think you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the months to come. It's very uh, recent research, but I think you'll be hearing more about it. I have a question from Tara. If you want to expose your child to another language but don't have regular access to a native speaker, is there a next best alternative? Should you simply wait until they're older? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, I would say that um, give your child as much English, if that's your language, as you can. Um, we know that your proficiency in learning a second language is at least partially um, related to your proficiency in your first language. That's what makes it so hard in some settings where children are hearing lots of non-native speakers and they're in poverty and they're not hearing much language language at all, is that by the time they get to school, they may not have very good control over the language in the home or the language that they're supposed to be learning in school. So I would just say, you know, speak, use a lot of language interaction with your child, get their English really, really good. And then uh, we do have immersion preschools in, in the vicinity and, and also around the country, and those things are very helpful too, uh, where you just sort of throw your child into an environment where they are not using English much at all, but they are exposed to native speakers of another language. There's no harm in waiting. Um, we know that you can learn a language at virtually any age, clearly teaching second languages as we do in the United States more towards middle school and high school is not a very good tack to take, but we don't have information that starting your child on a language at five, for instance, rather than two or three is going to make that much difference. They should still become very native speakers if they're exposed to native uh, speakers as models. All right, I have a question from Bonnie, and she asks, I am interested in the area of executive function. What can you briefly tell me about research in this area and methods for improving executive function in children? Wow, I'm not sure you can do that very easily in children. Um, executive function is memory and attention um, are the most common ones, um, and certainly, um, you know, if you don't have good, if you're a distractible child, uh, you are probably not going to get as much out of the environment if you're, as if you're a child who can focus more readily. Um, children's memory is actually, it, it grows with, with time, just like adults uh, do to a point. Um, and um, memory in, in, humans is vastly aided by language, it turns out. We don't usually use memory to do too much that doesn't involve language, except memorizing things like uh, pins and, and phone numbers. Um, and so one of the best ways to probably get memory to be better in children is, again, to teach lots of language and to encourage children to review what they're experiencing and to remember what they're experiencing using language. Um, attention 
that's a tough one. I mean, children differ in the amount of attention that they want to pay. One of the things that we do know is that um, there is a, a real association in language development between um, what are so-called adult-led interactions and child-led interactions. So one of the problems is that it's somewhat difficult to get children to do well if the adults are constantly trying to direct the interaction rather than follow the child's lead in the interaction. And we do find that um, it may be better over time to go with the child's flow early on to get the language benefits of that and then as the child gets older executive functions do mature with age. They are not as good in very young children as they are in older children and adults um, and not worry so much about it at, at very young ages. Great. We have a question from Rachel. How are lisps formed? My husband and I both pronounced our R's like W's when we were children. Will we be likely will that be likely in our baby? Okay, we actually don't call that one a lisp, but we call a lisp uh, when you have trouble with S. But um, articulation disorders do run in families uh, quite a bit, as do other language problems and reading problems. So yeah, it's possible that if you uh, needed therapy to get over an R problem as a child, your child may as well. Um, therapy for articulation is, is incredibly successful. It's one of the areas of the speech-language pathology field that we can be most proud of, actually, is that um, it's it's about the most effective interaction we have therapeutically with kids. It usually doesn't take very long and it's usually quite successful. So I think in this case, yes, um, you, your child might have trouble mastering their R sounds, but it probably won't affect them in any other way. Um, and since you know in some respects that yours lasted for a while, you might not wait as long as the next parent to go in and see if you can give that child a push. Great. Um, Kathy writes, are there any concerns about how television noise in the background can impact language development? Yeah, we are actually very concerned about this and we actually have um, research in progress. It's with the same families that I was talking about. Every family filled out a huge questionnaire that specifically asked about the amount of time that TV and radio were on in the household and other sources of noise in the household. I, I'll have to sort of beg off and sort of sort of like the uh, fall TV season say that I'd have to get back to you on this, but we suspect from other small studies that background noise is not helpful to young children learning language. We actually do have data showing that children who are schooled in schools that um, are close to sources of noise like airports actually do show learning decrements. Um, this is a very, very recent source of concern in the field uh, for how much noise might not just drown out other signals but actually sort of aggravate other functions like attention perhaps. Um, and so I would say that background noise is probably not helpful to children would be a safe thing to say. Um, again, I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier in case people chipped in in the middle, but that uh, TV go having TV going on while you're sitting with a child discussing what is on television like Sesame Street or Dora the Explorer or Blue's Clues or any sort of toddler show, that is not bad. Uh, a cartoon, a Disney cartoon, if you're talking while the TV is playing and you're talking about what the TV is doing, that's probably very helpful. But if there's just a TV on for the sake of having noise in the background or somebody's always got the TV on while you're trying to have an interaction with your child, that's probably not very helpful. Great. Um, from Pilar, uh, her question is, uh, we have a nanny whose native language is not English. At what age would you recommend moving our child to daycare? <laughs> uh, when you would otherwise move your child to daycare. Um, I have never had a native uh, English-speaking nanny. Uh, my kids had nannies. My uh, husband was raised um, on the Mexican border and most of his daycare providers did not speak English. I would have your nanny speak to your child using her native language and uh, as long as you can continue to come home and talk to your child, you could probably homeschool that kid and that child would have wonderful language. Um, it, basically, children are not quite sponges. It's not like they can learn everything at, at once so that a million languages can go in and there are, there are no problems. But generally speaking, a child can be raised with one uh, parent or one caretaker who does nothing but speak to them in 
in their native language and you show very little decrement, uh, if any, on their learning of English as long as there are other providers, other caretakers in the household, parents, relatives, uh, who speak English to the child and speak it often. Uh, so I, I would actually say send your child to daycare when you would like to send your child to daycare, but it, it shouldn't make any difference. Um, but I would, if the, if the nanny is being encouraged to speak English and you don't believe that her English is all that fabulous, I would tell her that you'd rather have her speak in her native language to your child. Um, both my, one, child, one of my children learned Hindi and another one learned French, um, and they did very well, and they did very well on their verbal SATs and in graduate school and so on and so forth, and they never showed any problems learning language. Uh, this, mess, or this question is from Glenn. Uh, do you have any data about the value, if any, of playing classical music to toddlers? Um, I just, I've lost you for a moment. I think it's the value of playing classical music. That is correct. Uh, yeah. Um, again, um, it's not clear that babies are really developing an appreciation of music, per se, when this happens. Um, I think having fun with your child listening to classical music once they're born is a wonderful thing. I think children take interest in things their parents take interest to very often. Um, we do believe that a lot of the nuances of things like classical music are probably not coming through perfectly um, during uh, the last trimester of pregnancy. It's mostly bass sounds and importantly it's also what the mother is saying because the mother, uh, the baby can hear the mother called uh, through what's called bone conduction. So literally, the baby hears the mother speaking much better than the baby hears any external source of sound or noise. Um, uh, the external sources are mainly things like deep bass sounds. Um, if you really want to alarm a baby in the last tr uh, trimester of pregnancy, go take them to a rock concert and sit close to the speakers. You'll have a great time. I, I assure you, try that experiment um, because uh, it, it does work. Uh, the, uh, but the classical music usually, of course, doesn't have that kind of prop set of properties. And so I would say if you want your child to enjoy classical music, bond with them enjoyably over classical music from infancy onward. Great. I think we have time for two more questions, Nan. So the first one being, is there a suggested amount of time to read to babies to keep their interest and increase re retention? Um, you know, lots of little things work better than long things. So um, I happen to give every baby, uh, every baby gift I give is usually a board book and a plush toy so that the baby can chew on the toy while the mom flips the pages of the board book. Um, you don't need to do it extensively. Little bits of time, a set amp routines like um, we're going to get you quiet before your nap or before you go to sleep. Um, probably enough. You don't have to do lots and lots of things for a long time. It's setting up the value for the book, um, that the books are an experience, and then taking some amount of time to think about the kinds of books that your kids seem to enjoy as opposed to others. My kids enjoy very, very different kinds of books. One of my kids really enjoyed books that rhymed, um, starting as a toddler, and the other one had couldn't, couldn't have cared less. Um, he liked books that had certain pictures in them, but both of them enjoyed sitting and interacting over the books. So I would just say, you know, take your child's lead. If your child looks fed up uh, at the moment, don't push it, but keep, keep coming back for little amounts of time with different types of written materials just in case your child has taste in books that differs from what you thought they should enjoy. Great. And then the last question is from Kathy. Do you find language ability difference between toddlers who attend daycare or, or preschool versus those who don't? This has actually been well investigated by the, uh, a number of federal studies. It's not child care versus home. It's the quality of child care versus home. So uh, high quality child care that has a, a small number of children per adult caretaker uh, shows no difference from uh, children raised with uh, their parents in the home environment or a dedicated babysitter in the home environment. So it's really not about whether or not the child is in daycare. It's what does that daycare look like. And so parents should be looking to see whether or not there are enough in adults in the environment to spend the time to talk with that child and interact with that child uh, during the course of the day, as I said earlier, um, in terms of the kinds of interactions that help children learn. Obviously, if there's 
uh, too many kids per adult in the daycare environment, you're not going to be able to get as much of that. So look at the quality of the daycare, not whether it's daycare or not daycare. Great, thank you. Um, I have uh, nothing left uh, from a question perspective. So Nan, if you would like to wrap up, we will let people go about the, the rest of their day. Okay, well, um, I hope that you enjoyed this little uh, journey through a couple of major issues and how to help your child learn to talk. And I put back the slide that has my email address. I'm a wonderful pen pal. Um, I've also uh, listed some sites that you can visit, including our department where a lot of this work gets done, um, and two other sites, our Autism Research Consortium and our Infant and Child Studies Consortium. Um, I would also say that if I said things that you didn't quite believe and you'd like to sort of see where the references are for those uh, particular concepts, I'll be more than happy to send you references for any of the ideas that I was talking about today. So I thank you very much for listening. This has been fun. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.